Welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Irrigation Training Series. I'm your host, Richard Rastusha, and today we're going to be talking about irrigation scheduling. And the reason we're talking about irrigation scheduling is for a couple of reasons. Number one, it is complex to do. And uh, for every person who has just gotten frustrated, thrown their hands up and put uh, 20 minutes of zone four times a week on their controller and walked away, and we're happy with that, uh, you're going to learn a new way today uh, that's going to make this, um, I don't know if it's going to make it any easier than what you were doing, but it's going to make it a lot more accurate. So that's the good news. We're also going to talk a lot about um, how um, Jane Unity uh, smart controller software can actually uh, do this activity for you and uh, what a difference that'll make in uh, not just your productivity or time, but uh, uh, the beauty of your landscape, uh, as well as um, uh, in increasing the time you have available to do some other things. So anyway, taking us through this uh, journey is uh, Andy Bellingary, the National Sales Manager at uh, Jane Irrigation. Um, as you know, you've seen Andy on this uh, on these webinars often. He does a great job explaining complex um, subjects in a very easy to understand manner. I've worked with uh, Andy now for, uh, gosh, a little over eight years at Jane and a few more years uh, before that at Valley Crest. Um, he's been involved in the landscape industry since uh, uh, his time at, uh, at uh, BYU as a horticultural major there, coming out uh, working with uh, and managing landscape crews in the field working his way into sales and now as a national sales manager for Jane. So uh, we're really fortunate to have Andy. I know you're gonna enjoy his presentation today. Uh, Andy, uh, the big news in the past couple of weeks is the, uh, uh, the merger of two uh, dominant irrigation players in the industry, uh, Jane and Rivulus. Uh, we're a few weeks into it, maybe two and a half weeks into it now. Um, just want to, you know, I see your Jane by Rivulus uh, logo here. Just want to touch base with you and ask you, how's it going so far? So far, so good. It's It's been great, actually. You know, I was thinking when I joined the Jane team eight years ago, but you can go back a little bit further, Richard. I remember when you left Valley Crest and you went to work for Jane, I thought, who's Jane? And then I dug deeper. I'm like, oh, I know these products. I know the Spin Clean Filter. I know the Octobubbler, you know, Pepco and API. I knew some of these brands. Uh, and I think for a lot of the landscape contractors across the country, through our efforts, they know Jane. Now, a lot of landscape contractors may not know Rivulus. Rivulus has is, is been more of an ag player, a little bit kind of a, a newer name on the front, but they come from a long line, deep uh, heritage in the, the irrigation industry. And I have always said the best irrigation products come from agriculture. Um, if you're not in ag, Sorry, this hurts your feelings, but if you're not an ag, you're not a real player in the irrigation industry. You're just a, a cheap knockoff. And if you're a contractor, if the product you're using isn't used in ag, maybe you should rethink the quality of the product you're using. But to all the contractors that don't know Rivulus, distributors for that matter as well, you will get to know Rivulus. I think you're going to be deeply impressed with who they are as a company. I uh, had the chance to, to, to spend a little bit of time with some of these people. Richard Klappoltz, who's a global CEO of Dynamic leader, great guy, dedicated to uh, the betterment of our industry. Uh, John Vickaputz, another um, uh, industry veteran, and, uh, and Zeb, and some of these guys who, who have been around for a, a long amount of time, they are, they are dedicated to seeing not only our company, everybody's dedicated to their own company success, but the success of our customers and contractors. So I say to uh, the contractors out there, you may not know Rivulus, but uh, um, you will, and you'll be glad you did. Yeah, so uh, so great to hear, Andy. And yeah, I agree with you. I think it's just going to raise the level of the whole industry uh, because of the synergies we're creating as two companies coming together. It's making it um, uh, really competitive and we have a lot more to offer now. And that's really exciting for our customers. It is. Yep. So, well, listen, let's get into smart irrigation scheduling. Uh, this is what um, uh, uh, tends to uh, stump people, right? I do a lot of presentations myself, uh, teaching people how long uh, and how often to water. Uh, so I'm glad you're tackling it today on the webinar. Well, I'm going to do my best. And, and Richard, I've heard you say this before, and I've gotten the same questions. Two most common questions you get, how long should I run my irrigation system? How often should I run my irrigation system? Those are those are, are two complex things. I think so many times people just either they do what they've always done or, you know, some guy in the newspaper, an article said, oh, run your station uh, three minutes 
uh, five times a day, six days a week, and you'll be good. And uh, they never make any adjustments from there. So th these, are, these are two great questions. And people who are thinking about doing the right thing, increasing their plant health and, and uh, decreasing water usage, uh, these are two important questions to ask. But I will say, to kind of set up the premise of everything here today, we don't water plant material. I know that may, for some people that might make sense to others, they may think, well, what do you mean we don't water plant material? When we, when we want to be smart about irrigation management, we got to get out of the mindset of I'm watering the grass, I'm watering the tree, I'm watering the flower. We water the soil. We fill the soil. It's all about soil moisture balance. We fill that soil with water and then there's an interface, a relationship between the plant root and the soil. And that's true for fertilizing as well. We don't fertilize plants necessarily, sometimes through osmosis, but typically we, we, we load the soil with nutrients and it's the, the organic matter or the mineral properties of the soil that allows it to hold on to those nutrients in the water than the plant can t uptake. So um, wanted to get those two things out of the way. So we're gonna answer these two questions today. How long should I run my system and how often should I run my system? And really the goal here is we wanna use water efficiently, right? And we want to be as profitable as possible as well. And maybe, uh, you can, and, I, and I, I'm here to say you can make money in irrigation management, but I'm thinking profitability as a, uh, sometimes you become more profitable by reducing expenses. And then of course, we want to be sustainable in our efforts. And it, it, I think to sum it up, um, the best thing to say is we want to maximize the output. That's the aesthetics, the plant health, why we have landscapes to begin with. And we want to do that while we're minimizing those inputs. Water is a primary input, but fertilizer and labor are, um, are uh, costly inputs as well. And uh, as I said earlier, we do this by properly managing our soil moisture balance. Yeah. Hey, Andy, we got a couple of questions already, and I All want right. to remind everybody I've got the Q&A and chat open. So if you've got some questions for Andy, put them in there and I'll get them to him when it's appropriate. But um, uh, first question is this, uh, man, that photo doesn't look like a waterwise uh, landscape. Um, no, the one you just had on, yeah, with the bench. Uh, where was that taken and what's that an example of? Uh, I think that's the Colorado, the Denver Botanical Garden. Um, that is all drip irrigated. I believe it was installed by Valley Crest. And uh, you can have, and I'll show these two pictures, you can have beautiful looking landscape that is that maximizes aesthetics, like I said, and also minimizes the input water. It can it can be done. Um, it's it's through a uh, properly designed system, but it's also through uh, uh, you know proper cultural practices, managing the soil moisture balance in such a way that you can uh, achieve the results you want while minimizing the the, the water you're using. So it it, it uh, that is very much a uh, a water wise. A lot of that's native plant material as well, which helps. But you can you can have uh, your cake and eat it too, as they say. Yeah, so I don't have to have the wagon wheel, the cactus, and the rocks. No, and I, I used to include that picture, the uh, what I call trailer park landscape. Um, don't forget the garden gnome. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I forgot about that. Hole. So then the other thing is uh, just a comment that somebody was saying they're really happy to hear this because water is getting so expensive these days. You know, people are paying uh, in San Diego as much as uh, 18 bucks for uh, 748 gallons. So uh, 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 this, this, this is really uh, good news. So some basic equipment that's going to be needed for us to, to do this here. Number one, you got to start with a properly designed irrigation system. That can be a webinar in and of itself, but uh, we're, you know, you have to have a properly designed irrigation system. Um, to properly manage that irrigation system, you need a device or method to measure the precipitation rate. And we'll get into what that means. You need a gauge or a measuring device to know how much rain has fallen and how much of that is effective rain. Um, just because I get an inch of rain doesn't mean I'm getting an inch of water into the soil. If I'm getting an inch of rain and it, and it falls in 10 seconds like it does in the desert so often, uh, you end up with a flash flood and all, very little of that water gets into the soil. So we wanna understand how much rain and then how much of that was effective rain that got in the soil. We'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, we need a method or, or a measurement tool to monitor soil moisture levels. Because if we're uh, looking at soil moisture balance, we need to know those levels. 
And uh, another, another critical component is uh, reliable data, how much water the landscape is actually using each day. And we'll, we'll get into some of these details here in a minute, but just wanted to uh, um, expand on this critical things that we have to know. Um, so we're watering the soil, but we have to know where those roots are in the soil. We don't want to water soil that doesn't have roots. But we don't also want to water, not water soil that does have roots. Uh, it's either we're wasting water on one side or killing the plant on the other. And this example is a little bit of an exaggeration here. You don't have flowers with one foot root depth and very few trees, at least in uh, compacted uh, um, uh, developed areas have, have uh, tree roots that are three feet depth deep. But, but, it, but it paints uh, an exaggerated picture that different plant material have different root depths. Flowers, uh, annuals, and perennials may be four to eight inches deep. Shrubs may be 12 to 18 inches, and, and trees can be in the 18 to 24 inch depth range. So understanding where the roots are in the soil is one of the first key things we have to understand when we want to manage the water, how deep the roots are. Yeah, I think this is a big aha moment, right? Because how, uh, right, big buzzword in the industry is, you know, water deeply and not very often. And so if I've got a perennial in my garden that's got a six inch root zone and I'm watering it for an hour with a two gallon an hour emitter, I'm just wasting water, right? You're wasting, yeah. I remember my, my grandma several years ago, she, before she had an irrigation system, I was hand watering like my grandpa used to do all her trees. She said, oh, I don't think that tree needs water. It probably has roots that go to China. It's probably tapped into some aquifer. And I didn't have the heart to correct my grandma, but I'm thinking, now those roots are only in the top 18 inches. And anyway, it, I didn't, I didn't want to turn into the horticulture nerd. I just said, oh yeah, I'm sure. Anyway, so you know, you're right. You, it's, uh, you water past the root zone, you waste water. Yeah. Yeah. And so, right. So I think it's a matter of, right, slowing that flow uh, to the root zone. So it, uh, so it doesn't flow past, but I guess that's another webinar. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> but but the, the takeaway here is just put the water in the root zone. Right, get yeah. the water in the root zone. Any let it too little, the plant dies. Too much, you're wasting water. Right. Um, okay. Another thing we have to know is again, we're watering soil here, so this becomes important. There's a lot of things going on with soil. You have to know your soil texture. And by texture, what we mean is the percent sand, silt, and clay. And this is another entire webinar in and of itself. But the key takeaway here is knowing that a sandy soil water will move, an inch of water will move deeper in sandy soil, um, but not have as much there um, in the long run compared to a clay soil. Water in clay soil doesn't move as deep, um, but, but it retains, there's, there's more retained there. So you, we have to understand what that soil texture is like. And there are some complex tests to figure that out. Um, I think my next webinar, maybe I'll, 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 I'll show the little trick I know on how to, uh, how to uh, figure out your soil texture pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but this becomes important too when you look at emitter spacing in drip irrigation. Uh, uh, sandy soil, maybe you need to keep uh, 12 inch spacing. Uh, clay soil, sometimes 18 to 24, uh, maybe more spacing. So we have to know our soil texture. Um, and I've got a list here of other critical things that we have to know beyond root depth and soil texture. We have to know the soil water infiltration rate. And what that is, is how quickly the water can absorb into the soil. And if you apply water too quickly or faster than it absorbs, it just runs off and it's wasted. That's why we talk about rain and effective rain. A nice steady drizzle is great because it gives time for the water to soak into the soil. Um, a big, you know, summer uh, monsoon, a uh, uh, cloudburst is bad because you know you get you get all that water falls at once. So we we need to know the infiltration rate of uh, of the soil so we can match our uh, the next term here is our precipitation rate. Precipitation rate is uh, well in, in in rain it's it's how, how you know how many inches per hour is rain falling, but in irrigation it's it's um, how many inches per hour we're putting out either through our drip irrigation system or our sprays or our rotors. And we wanna make sure our precipitation rate does not exceed the infiltration rate in inches per hour. And, and then um, when we know that we can get uh, 
some, uh, it helps us dial in our irrigation practices. Next term on here, soil water content. That's how much water can actually be stored uh, in the soil, total water in the soil. And that's different than plant available water. And this may be eye-opening to a lot of people. Just because water's in the soil does not mean the plant can get it. Um, some of that water is held so tightly by those molecular bonds that the plant just can't get it out. So that leads to our next term, the plant available water. Um, uh, some other terms are saturation. That's just uh, you know water moving through a soil profile. When it stops moving by gravity, and it's actually held there in tension by the by the the bonds within the soil and the, the air spaces. Um, we call that fill capacity. Um, when that water starts to get used up and uh, we get to where the plants start to die, that's called permanent wilting point. Permanent wilting point is uh, there's water in the soil, but the plants can't get to it, and they're you know they're going to wilt permanently. We call that death. In between filled capacity and permanent wilting point, we have this minimal minimum allowable balance. Um, and, and then in our, our, the next slide, we'll touch on that. There's also evapotranspiration and distribution uniformity that are key terms here. This di uh, picture, I guess, diagram at the bottom shows distribution uniformity. It's uh, knowing that your irrigation system may not, may not evenly apply water. Some areas are gonna get more than others. Um, and, and having that, uh, having an understanding of that helps us uh, manage our irrigation system as well. So it's just a simple way to, to say how, how, uh, how, how maybe efficient the irrigation system is at applying water evenly across uh, the area we're trying to irrigate. So a lot of complex terms, a lot of things going on here. And it, it, uh, but this, this will help make a lot of sense on this next slide. Soil moisture balance. We talked about saturation. We talked about permanent wilt, wilting point. That's the dark, well, that's the black and the light gray. Right here in this medium gray, this is the happy spot for all the, the plants to grow in. This is filled capacity. This is the maximum amount of water in the soil that's held on to the soil. And then there's this spot right here we call minimum balance. This is the place just before plants start to experience water stress. So if we irrigate our plant materials and we fill that Oh, and again, I just said it wrong. See, we don't irrigate plant materials, we irrigate uh, soil. If we add water to the soil for the, uh, for the plants to use, it starts here, right? And when do we water again? Well, we wanna water again when we get to this, this place here. If we can keep the water and the soil profile right in here, we're gonna have happy plants. And it's, that is, uh, uh, that sets up a really uh, uh, critical understanding for answering the question, how often do I water and how long do I water? So, um, but this is this is a uh, this chart becomes a uh, really helpful understanding soil moisture balance. Yeah, it sure does, Andy, because it does a couple things for me. Right. I understand that uh, if I hit that saturation point, I'm really, you know, and I see it when I water sometimes if I'm hand watering, I can see when the soil hits saturation, it just starts to run off. It, uh, it won't go into the soil fast enough. Um, and then of course, I know permanent wilting point, unfortunately, I've, I've seen that a few times in my life. And, uh, but uh, yeah, the sweet spot is um, uh, a little harder to stay in than most people would like to think. Um, and so are you gonna cover the, we had, we saw those variables, all those variables impact this uh, field capacity and, and, uh, and the sweet spot? Every single one of those variables do. Now in a perfect world, um, water would be added to soil, it would be at filled capacity, and it would just stay there. So, so we begin to ask ourselves, well, what makes the water go away, right? And there's a, there, there's, there's a couple key, there's evaporation, and there's transpiration. And I'm sure everybody was out yelling, yelling to the, like I like to yell at the radio, or the, or the uh, TV when I'm watching sports, like anybody can hear. But uh, I'm sure people were shouting evapotranspiration. That is what takes us from build capacity down to either you know permanent wilting point for example it's what takes water out of the soil it's water loss due to uh, evaporation and uh, transpiration evaporation we know that it what that is transpiration is just a simple biological process of tree roots or plant roots taking water up through the roots moving it through 
the stems and eventually exiting the leaves in, in the form of water vapor. So that is, uh, um, and we can measure this. We know how much water is being lost out of the soil through evaporation and transpiration. And that uh, is a term we call evapotranspiration. A couple of the factors, these are easy ones. There's 17 total actually that you should uh, be looking at. And if you're not looking at them, then, then uh, you're, you're, you're missing out on an opportunity to, to uh, save water. But some of the basic factors include solar radiation. Uh, of course, temperature, the hotter the day, the more you're gonna see evaporation and transpiration. Humidity, higher humidity would equal less transpiration, evaporation, and then wind velocity. Higher winds dry things out quicker. We've all experienced this. You get out of a pool on a hot, windy day, you dry off really quick. You get out of a pool on a cold, cloudy, overcast day with no wind, you're gonna stay wetter longer. The biggest impact in all of this is solar radiation. Yeah, so Andy, if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, these factors change every day. Every hour. They change during the day, right? Yes. So what you're saying is if I want smart scheduling, I would have to be calculating this pretty regularly every day and changing it on my controller uh, every day. So here's, the, here's the, the, the biggest thing is that every single zone you have is going to have different relationships between plant, soil, and environmental conditions that affect the water that's being lost out of the root zone. Uh, therefore, yeah, uh, not only every day, hourly every day, but for every zone that you have, you should be calculating this. Yeah, okay. Now I think I understand why people set their controllers to the hottest day of the year and then adjust it down 25% in the fall, 50 in the winter, back up 25 and only adjust it four times a year, right? Yeah, and that's, you know, that's that's certainly a practice, but um, I was having a conversation actually at the ASIC and somebody said, we well, you know the problem with the water issue in the West is too many people live out there. We need to get rid of the people and we won't have a water <laughs> issue. And I thought, well, that is the most backwards thinking I've ever heard. That, that's not the solution. The solution is let's be more intelligent and do better jobs of managing. We have plenty of resources. I have said it on this webinar multiple times. The world has enough resources and to spare. The question is, how are we managing those resources? And can we become more efficient? Can we use the technology we have so that more people can appreciate uh, the benefits of a, of a, a well-designed and, and manicured landscape? Yeah, I love that, Andy. Right, we didn't uh, we didn't solve the uh, energy uh, issues or the uh, gas emission issues in the United States by banning cars. Uh, we made them better with technology. We're using yes. uh, you know electric power now. So we can, uh, yeah, that's we can uh, that's funny. Thing. Whoever said that? Yeah, we can do the same thing in uh, in landscapes. Um, now, Richard, you touched on this. So evapotranspiration. You can you can look at well. You see this nice gentle curve. You can predict based on historical averages what that curve is going to look like. And a lot of people will, you know, manage that based on, you know, on average, it's going to be here. On average, you know, April 26th in Las Vegas, Nevada is going to be probably in the 80s. Well, sometimes it's in the mid 90s and sometimes it's in the 60s. And that's going to affect how much water I need. And you can see that on this. Uh, the, the daily, the, the jig jag, jig, zigzag, <laughs> the zigzag line here. These are daily fluctuations of ET. So it just really to drive home the point, we should be measuring evapotranspiration on a daily basis if we really want to get the most um, out of uh, plant health and uh, water conservation. I'll tell you what, Andy, uh, this is true, I think, right? More than ever, people are experiencing the weather today isn't like it was in the past. <laughs> it's oh. it's really changing dramatically. And gosh, I was comparing my uh, my April water bill this year to my April water bill last year, and it's dramatically different because we've had so much rain here in California. I haven't had to turn on any irrigation for a long time, and I'm I'm saving a ton. And uh, if I was based on what happened last year, I'd be pouring water on right now. Yeah, uh, it, every every day of every year, every season is going to have variabilities. Um, Mother Nature doesn't live on our calendar. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, okay, we get to this question. How long should I run my irrigation system? And the answer is really simple. And we're going back to this chart. 
you only have to run it long enough to fill the root zone to fill capacity. And that's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's that, it's that easy. Um, I shouldn't say it's that easy. It's that simple. Um, it may not be that easy, but it is really that simple. Long enough to fill this space right here between our allowable, de allowable depletion. How, how much will we allow the soil to be depleted before the plant starts to stress? And, uh, to fill capacity. That's how long we run that system. Now, factors that we have to consider. What's our soil texture? Because different soils have different water holding capability. What's the soil infiltration rate? Because um, I may need to run my irrigation system for 18 minutes to fill that, but I might have to do it three times to because this uh, infiltration rate is really slow. It could be a slow, it could be compacted soils. So I need to know that. Of course, I need to know my precipitation rate of my irrigation system. We already explained why. I need to know the distribution uniformity and I need to know the root zone depth. When I have those factors, I can then, with a simple formula, calculate how long to run it. And uh, th this is the formula. So runtime is I times 60 divided by PR times VU, where I is the irrigation required to fill the root zone in inches. PRs are pre uh, precipitation rate, DUs are distribution uniformity. Um, 60 is just a, uh, a standard, a constant figure that puts everything into minutes. It's just a uh, help, helps bring, bind everything together. It's like a, a glue, I guess. Um, and if you don't know your precipitation rate, you can calculate that um, by taking 96.3, which is another constant. Multiply that by your gallons per minute, which is GPM. And then that's divided by S times L. S, is, S times L is just your area. That's a spacing between sprinklers or emitters. And then L is the spacing between the rows of sprinklers or emitters. So that's just the, the, the area, square footage of area that's being, that's being irrigated. Um, and th th that's how you can calculate a, a sprinkler runtime. And uh, that, that'll, get you, uh, that'll get you there. Um, yeah, question. So I was just going to say, look, um... I happen to like math, but uh, that's a lot of math, and that's a lot of data to collect on a regular basis. Is there uh, is there an easier way to do this? There is, but I'm not done with the math yet. There's uh, okay. we have only we've only answered one question, and if you're on math overload, just I promise you, you, you you're going to get to the point where your head's going to want to explode. But then I'm going to give you a really really easy answer at the end. So if you just hang in there, there is a simple solution that will make your life so easy. Um, but I promise you, if you do understand these basics, um, the technological application, you'll be better able to choose the right technology to, to solve this easy. And then, uh, you know, um, I'm going to spill the secret. There is technology to manage all this for us. Um, but so the second question is, how often should I run my system? What frequency? And that is that is when withdrawals exceed this deposit, when ET exceeds uh you know water coming in through irrigation or, or to rain um and uh we to 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 know that we just need to know how much water um is in the soil root zone at fill capacity we need to know how much water is there currently and we need to know how much uh water what's the minimum water balance that trigger point again uh we have those three that's what's going on in the soil and then we have the forecasted plant water use um and with those, there's a there's another another simple formula where we just take the water balance in the root zone currently, subtract the minimum allowable balance, divide that by the forecasted plant water use, which is just we, we call that ETC to the uh, that's the remember evapotranspiration. That's the how much water is being lost to evaporation and transpiration. And we follow that formula, it'll tell us how many days um we can uh go in between our watering cycles and and again i want to drive home this point those two formulas i just gave for irrigation runtime and frequency that should be something that is looked at really if you're doing it right on a daily basis and i know uh you know guys in agriculture where they they really are trying to minimize inputs and, and maximize that outputs uh, they are managing this on a on a minimum of a daily basis, something they pay very, very, very close attention to. So again, that's the answer to the questions. Uh, 
How often? As frequently as needed to fill the root zone with water. How long? Long enough to fill the root zone with the water, right? So I've taken, and, and, and I'm being a little facetious here, I'm trying to overly simplify something that can really be very complicated. Um, but uh, you could do this. You could sit out at every zone you have and run these calculations and do it every hour of every day. And that would be your full-time job and you wouldn't enjoy life. Um, or maybe you would, and you're just uh, sadistic like that. <laughs> uh, there is a simpler way, uh, and you can use a, uh, a smart controller. Now, um, this happens to be an ET water smart controller. Smart controllers, in theory, not all smart controllers, but the principle behind it is, is it takes all of these complex complications or uh, uh, computations out of it, and it does them for you. Uh, it it uh, will look at the weather. It'll look at the plant water needs, and it and it will um, do these things that uh, you have to do manually and take uh, hours of time to do. It can do those computations in in, in a matter of seconds. Uh, create a schedule and have you off and running. One problem with that is is there are um, not all smart controllers are created equal. Um, this was this was another webinar, and, and you can go back and watch. I believe it was DJ Caldwell did this smart, smarter, and smartest. I encourage you guys to go out to our website and revisit this. You can get a much more in-depth presentation on what the difference is between smart, smarter, and smartest. But uh, for simplicity's sake, some controllers don't create a schedule. They manipulate a pre-programmed schedule based on temperature. And I say weather, but primarily temperature. So if you have an erroneous schedule to begin with, um, either too high or too low, and then you're only making a percent adjustment on top of that, you could be exasperating a problem or just barely improving a situation. Uh, so Andy, vast, yeah. yeah, I just want to clarify this because we did have a question coming in about this very thing. Um, so Chain Unity, uh, ET Water Controllers, actually set the initial schedule for the user. Is that right? Yes, we create schedule, a custom schedule, yes. Right, so then with other controllers, they may rely on the user to set the schedule. Yes. And again, if the user isn't looking at all these things, these factors, they could set a incorrect schedule and it's just gonna adjust off that schedule and when it adjusts, does it adjust frequency or does it uh, adjust time that it waters? You know, I, uh, some of them, some of them, well, if you have the pre-adjusted schedule, it's adjusting the watering time because that frequency is going to be set by the schedule that was already in there. Uh, and that becomes dangerous because, again, we're, we want to fill the root zone with water. And if we're going less than that, we're cheating that that plant. And then plants look stressed. So what do you do? You bump up the, the schedule even more. and it really, it, it exasperates the problem. Uh, the smartest category, and there's only two, what I consider truly smart controllers on the market, smartest controllers will generate a schedule, a unique schedule every day based on live climate data. And that's something that ET Water does very well. We we're looking at weather data specific to your site. And based on that data, based on the soil characteristics, plant characteristics, we generate a schedule uh, specific to that. Um, and we've taken it from the daily basis, which uh, one of our competitors does. We are now looking at that on an hourly basis. Again, ET, you see this broad, gentle curve in a, in a year. There's also a broad, gentle curve in a day. And when you look at it hourly, it really starts to bounce around. You can get uh, really big uh, uh, differences to improve plant health and to save water by measuring it on an hourly basis. Yeah, that's really a big statement and important. I want to be sure I understand this correctly too, Andy. So um, if I take an ET water measurement at eight uh, in the morning, uh, and then I get rain at 10 in the morning, and then I get uh, uh, just a regular afternoon, the Jane Unity software will take into account that rain and, uh, and adjust the schedule accordingly. Yes, it'll it'll look at the, uh, it'll look at the, uh, all, all the other factors during the day and, and and uh, be able to make those adjustments. Uh, it's, it's measuring that uh, you know, hourly, 24 times a day versus one time a day. Yeah, so that's really big, right? Because we see many places, especially in the summer on the East Coast that get rain 
you know, three, four times a week in the afternoons. And if you're not taking that into account, you're probably way overwatering your landscape. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, you know, and it's not just the overwatering that, that is problematic to waste water. You're flushing fertilizer out of the soil profile and you're having to fertilize more. Um, you just, you're, you're compounding the problems of plant health uh, along with the water waste. Yeah. You're wasting labor, money, and uh, material. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's an important distinction. That's that's good to know. Yeah. Now I went through this uh, the, the beginning slides here. Really, you know, these complex understanding. I have to know my soil texture, infiltration rate, and all these calculations. I mean, it really can seem very, very overwhelming. I mean, I got to Google and I got to get a chart and I've got to put all this together. And if I don't carry the zero and I and I move a decimal point and then I'm watering for five hours instead of five minutes. I mean, these are the things that that can really stress somebody out. ET Water makes this so simple. Six simple steps, you can be set up, ready to go. Step one, what's your irrigation method? Spray, drip, bubbler, is it subsurface, right? Um, that's gonna determine our precipitation. And you can go in and adjust these. If you've done the catch can test, and you wanna go in and you wanna put in specifically what it is, um, you can do that as well. But it's as simple as choose the method, choose the plant material. And that gets into root depth, and it also gets into um, the evapotranspiration rate, what we call the, uh, the uh, crop coefficient. You know, so some, some plant materials need more water than others. Grass needs more than cactuses, right? Um, so root depth and, and use. So we allow you to choose this here. And again, this can all be customizable as well, but as simple as choosing what it is you have. Step three. Uh, no, this is a step two continue. I apologize. Is it a new plant or is it established? Um, new plants, we, we water a little bit different. We, we help them get established because they're, you know, the roots may not be to their, their potential yet. So we take that into account. For the establishment schedule, Andy, do I have to remember to go back and take it off? Uh, you know, if I forget or if the con my contractor forgets, is it going to be watering that establishment schedule for the uh, you know, until somebody changes it, how, how does that work? The beauty of technology is you can uh, have it do that thinking for you. We call that uh, artificial intelligence. It can, uh, it can, it can make that adjustment after a, a predetermined period of time. Excellent. Yeah, I <laughs> tend to forget those things. Yeah, we talked a lot about soil uh, water infiltration rate. Uh, well, that is, uh, in, in large extent, determined by slope. So. What's your slope? That's going to determine our infiltration rate. Do I need, can I run my uh, system for 18 minutes or do I have to run it um, for three minutes, um, six times? You know, so we, we, we take the guesswork out of it there. Soil type, um, sandy, sandy loam, loam, clay, loam, clay. Um, again, I promised a webinar on how to determine this if you don't know. The beautiful thing with ET Water, too, if you don't know any of this, we have a little help button and it'll tell you ways you could do you don't know your distribution uniformity we'll tell you we'll, we'll, we'll tell you how to, to find it you don't know what your soil type is we'll we'll show you ways that you can help um get that figured out but uh, soil type uh again it was one of the critical factors of determining a schedule um environmental um remember we said solar radiation was the leading factor in uh, in evapor evapotranspiration rates uh, if it's sunny all day, it's going to be a higher rate than if it's a uh, shady part of the day or shade all day. These are uh, exposure. If it's a southern exposure or northern exposure, eastern versus western, you're going to have uh, um, some of these factors. So we, we take this into consideration. And um, and, and that, that simple, you are set up, ready to go. And it all comes down to this concept of managing soil moisture balance, right? And I one of the things I love about the uh, Jane Unity software is the ET Water platform is that you don't need an expensive soil moisture sensor or a cheap, unreliable soil moisture sensor. We can, through science, through the understanding of soil properties, infiltration rates, root zone, the weather, we know, and by measuring rain, by measuring the irrigation we're putting into the soil, we know what the soil moisture balance is. And we can chart that and show it to you. I, I love watching this here. You have uh, 
the, the soil moisture balance, right, versus uh, ET, and you can see that day by day, that soil moisture balance starts to decrease as the, the uh, ET increases. This line right here is that trigger point. That was that minimum allowable depletion. It, we don't see it happen on this line, but it's getting, it's getting close to that point where it's going to be depleted. This is just a way for you to monitor what's going on. Um, and uh, let, letting technology work for, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are there are resources in the world to, to and to spare for for us. It's it's a question of uh, um, not that we necessarily need more resources, but what technology can we employ to better manage the resources and uh, and um, do more with uh, with 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 less, you know. So. Andy, we've got one question coming in right now, and the person's asking, is this a, um, uh, are these individual days, or is this just one day by the hour? I believe I'm looking at this. This looks like an hourly um, breakdown based on that curve up above. That would be, uh, that looks like we're going from morning, high noon, down into evening. And you can see that moisture balance as it progresses throughout the day. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, right? I, I yeah, I'm looking at the date now, six six. Um, so the sixth of June. I'm not sure uh, what year, but uh, six of June, and certainly you do see that ET pick up through the day, and uh, basically it's uh, during the uh, daylight hours is where you see the biggest uh, ET, and and you know you were mentioning that solar radiation being so important. Yeah, you know, one of the uh, issues I see contractors have um, it's the end of August. And uh, it's just as hot as it was at the end of June, but there's less daylight hours, there's less solar radiation, and usually more humidity, depending on what out west. Anyway, you get the monsoon, you need less water, but they don't adjust. It's still hot, and so many of the so-called smart controllers are temperature dependent as well. They don't even take into account solar radiation. Their their weather data they use is temperature based, and there's so much water that is wasted. Um, in, in spring and in fall, but really early summer and late summer, there's a lot of water that's wasted as well because uh, uh, we're not capturing all the data. Uh, ET Water, Jane Unity Software, 17 points of weather data that we're looking at. No one else does that. Um, and I, I like to say, and I'll, and I'll close with this thought, it's not about water conservation. It is, right? But water conservation is a byproduct of what we do. What we do, and we do it better than anybody else, is water efficiency. How do we maximize that output of plant health, plant production, and minimize that input? What is the minimum amount of water we can put in to maximize plant production? And that's that, that's what I call efficiency, and that's what we do better than anybody else. We are more efficient with the water um, water to plant output ratio, and that is the uh, that's the name of the game. Yeah, that's really an interesting way to think about it, and uh, and and I agree with you, right? We're definitely focused on conservation and sustainability, but the other side of it is too is uh, keeping all the landscapers, all the gardeners, all the homeowners, and all the growers in the game because uh, these prices are getting ridiculous uh, for water these days. So uh, if we can manage our water better, we're gonna we're gonna save because um, this is gonna put some people out of the game. It's just getting too expensive. Yeah. Uh, technology exists. Uh, it, uh, the, the practices exist. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, becoming educated. And I think I've mentioned it on here before. I think I've told you a story of the turkeys. Did you hear the story? The, the turkeys that learned how to fly and then they walked home. We don't want to. The, the, the moral of the story is don't be a turkey. <laughs> Yeah. So we've got uh, one last uh, time for one last question here, Andy, and somebody's uh, using the example of a football field. Can you tell the system when not to water, even though the system turn, tells you to turn water on? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, you can. You can set up windows where it does not water. And the, the real beauty of that with this predictive analytics with uh, the Unity platform is that we can take that into consideration and make adjustments with those water windows to make sure we never get beneath that uh, we never get to that permanent wilting point we never we never get too far beneath that um, that uh, minimum allowable balance or the maximum allowed depletion another way of saying the same thing uh, and it, it again you're having a machine think for you and it, to be able to to look ahead based on forecast and, and and to know what the plant is going to need and 
and uh, when it can water, when it can't water, things that, uh, you know, I guarantee you every landscaper has gotten that call on a Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. that says sprinklers are running and we have a wedding. And he's like, oh, I forgot, dang it. The, uh, the smart controllers don't do that. They, can, they, they think for you. It all, it all goes into there and it takes that stuff into account and makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. So Andy, just to clarify, you can tell it when not to water, but just as importantly, you can tell it when to water only during certain hours. Is that right? Yeah, you can set uh, you can set parameters of, you know, there's municipal restrictions. Certain days, maybe you can't water. Uh, you can set up those guidelines, uh, the parameters, and then the uh, controller can figure out uh, not only you tell it when it can water, but the best time during the day to water. Um, you know, what's the lowest uh, um, um, ET rate during the day was the least evaporation. We're going we're gonna, to, you know, aim to water at that point. Of course, there's um, you get short water windows. There's always complications, but uh, it, it can make some of those decisions as well, and, and really get you the uh, um, optimization of uh, of your of your irrigation uh, uh, efficiency. Yeah. So Andy, uh, you know, we we gave you a tall task today, right? A big task. Uh, make something very complex, easy to understand. Thank you. You hit the goal. Uh, definitely. I really appreciate that. Um, I see you've got your uh, contact information. Uh, do you mind if people reach out to you if they have more questions or uh, need a problem solved uh, with irrigation? Please do. My email is there. Cell phone is there. Call, text, email. Um, I'd love to hear from practitioners of the uh, art of irrigation. I, uh, I get a good friend of mine here in Vegas who I think knows more about irrigation just about anybody else I've ever met. Um, he always flatters me and tells me that he learned something from me, but I, I learned 10 times more from him. But uh, I love talking with people who are out and doing and practicing because I, I, I learned from that as well. So I appreciate the opportunity not only to do these presentations because I learned a little bit, but in talking to other people, it's uh, it's that collaboration that uh, fosters learning. Yeah. So, and I, Tom, I hope you're out there watching. I um, know what I was talking well, about. <laughs> again, thank you, Andy. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Uh, as you know, uh, we've got over 300 trainings now at the changeusa.com uh, forward slash trainings page. Uh, they're all free to watch. Uh, someone was reminding me today also that, uh, you know, they do count for continuing education credits with the Irrigation Association. So great way to uh, learn some more about irrigation in a very uh, easy and, uh, uh, as always, free way. And uh, as well as we do uh, uh, put these out as podcasts as well. So wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, um, we appreciate uh, you guys. If you have any suggestions of educational uh, items you'd like us to talk about, uh, please send me an email or send Andy an email on that, and we'd love to cover it for you. Again, thanks, everybody. Uh, really appreciate your time. We're going to be back next week with uh, Charles Hillier from the Wet Center, and uh, he's going to be talking about what the Wet Center is doing for growers in the Central Valley of California. So thanks again, Andy. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody.